any connections with the Middle East, um, that doesn't mean that we can't be connected because we're all one body. And, you know, God is just as present there as he is over here. Um, so, again, I just hope you hear my heart on this, that it's not, this isn't just my thing. You know, this wasn't a, just a trip that I went and did, but um, that we're starting to do, you know, as more as a body um, with English Lake, um, connecting with the churches over there. Um, and if you do have any more questions about the trip, you know, uh, specifically or like what, where we're heading um, and looking what we're looking to do specifically with churches over there, uh, feel, please feel free to talk with me about it. I love talking about the Middle East. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that to light, you know, that we were over there a couple weeks ago and we will be looking to go again probably this summer or this fall. Um, but yeah, so. Um, I have a, it's a double fold cornerstone care Sunday. I do have cards, but also at this point, at this time too, I do have um, what we're calling a care form. And what it does is just quick, simple uh, answers to questions so that we have a, a, a better feel of how we can bless you and serve you in and, and, and ways that are meaningful. So let's just say, uh, we want to get you flowers. Well, I like, you know, pink calla lilies, but maybe you like red roses, and I give you pink calla lilies, and you go, well, hey, thanks for the flowers, but you know what? I really like uh, red roses. So <laughs> it really helps if we know those simple things about you so that when a time comes where we want to celebrate with you or we want to bless you or we want to pray for you, we have a better way of reaching your heart in a way that you feel loved. So it's just real simple. And if you guys, I'm going to pass them out, and then if you guys would just fill them out, it, it, it's a half sheet, so I'll get those sent out. And then I also have uh, the care cards today as well. I don't like flowers at all. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, so if you would just take the time, let's just take time right now to fill that out. They want, yes, right now. You don't have a pen? You don't. <laughs> Laura May, that's, you're supposed to come to class with a pen or a pencil. <laughs> oh, I forgot, is this my math class still? <laughs> you may use a pen, you don't have to use a pencil. All right. Also, she is passing out, or Dave is passing out the the, the envelope so that if you can send a blessing uh, note to somebody that's not here, um, that would be great. So we're passing those out. Raise your hand if you'd like one of those. That's it. It's about caring for one another. And then uh, if you would fill those out and then uh, shall we have Charlie, could you could you maybe help them? We're S Sue, shall we collect these right now? Pass them to the end of the row. And maybe a couple of the ushers could help collect those.
last week was uh, Dave Fraley's birthday, right, Dave? Right? This week, Seth Hertzberger's birthday. Today. Where's Seth at? Oh, he's in the band. <laughs> I lose track of my son. Next thing you know, he'll be over in Israel again. Two more of these. One for Andy Rizzola and one for, for men. Oh, for men. Okay. One more for a man. All right. All right, everybody. Let's, uh, Ann shared this with me this morning. I'm just going to read a little passage from Lamentations and uh, just let this soak into your heart before we worship here today. This I recall in my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. His loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Um, this was just was my devotion for the week. I mean, I just contemplated on these verses all week. And just the one thing that I wanted to share about this, I mean, a lot of it's self-explanatory. But the line about uh, they are new every morning, you know, when we talk about the one thing, um, you know, God can speak something to you and then you hang on to that for six months and it really means a lot to you and that's what you share with everybody. And that's really great. That's a way that God um, speaks to us. But what I felt like God speaking to me is don't miss out on a day because every day I have something new to teach you, to speak to you. And um, so I, I guess that's what I just wanted to share that don't miss out on the, he's always fresh. He's always uh, just applicable to the situation. So that's all I wanted to share. All right. While we stand together, Josh. Well, good morning to everybody. Why don't we stand this morning? You know, this morning we, um, as we were preparing for this morning, we, I love singing songs about how big our God is. I love singing songs about how he's greater than anybody else or than anything else. And so this morning we have a theme of that about how we want to put God in his, in his place that he deserves to be in our lives, which is above everything else. So God, as we come today to worship you, we want to take a second and put our hearts in the right spot. No matter what's happened in our week, This is a time, a special time, when we get to come together and worship corporately and say together, God, you are high above everything else. From heaven's throne, you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made. For all our sin and all our shame, you took the nails and took our place. And no one else could do what you have done. Sing it one name. One name is higher. One name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all. And from the grave where death would die, you rose again and brought us life. You're 
the Savior of the world. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all, the only Savior, Jesus Messiah. To you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. We sing your praise, we sing your praise. We sing your praise forever and lift your name. We lift your name in Jesus over all. We sing, we sing your praise. We sing your praise. Sing your praise forever. Lift your name. Lift your name in Jesus over all. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever and lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all we sing, we sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever and lift your name, we lift your name. Jesus over all, one name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne, Christ exalted over all, the only Savior, Jesus Messiah, to you alone. Our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. To you alone, our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. Mm, we sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. Come on, sing it out. And lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. And lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. Yes, overall, God, we sing your praise. from the start waiting here for you with our hands lifted high in praise and it's you we adore Singing Hallelujah. Sing that again, waiting here. Waiting here 
for you with our hands lifted high in praise and it's you it's you we adore singing
God, would you be our everything? Would you be our joy? Would you be our strength? Because without you, we don't have anything. Be thou my vision, be thou my joy, my providence and my reward. Be thou the wisdom that I employ to trade my worth for yours. Be thou my refuge, be thou my strength, should my confession end. My heart sure whisper assuring then and trust your every word sing this together be thou exalted be thou exalted be thou exalted Jesus forever be thou exalted Be thou my passion, be thou my zeal, that I may offer thee. No great procession or vain appeal, but my sincerity. Oh, be thou exalted, be thou exalted, Jesus forever, be thou exalted forever.
Why don't we end our time together singing with this? For I exalt thee, and I exalt thee, I exalt thee, oh Lord, oh I exalt And I exalt Thee, and I exalt Thee, oh Lord, we exalt You, God, for we exalt Thee, we exalt Thee, we and we exalt thee oh Lord Father we exalt you that comes from our hearts Lord we lift you up and uh, proclaim you Father over all of the details that cloud our minds sometimes. We exalt you today. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated. You know, during our, our worship time together, I just encourage you to Use that time to, like Ann shared, just to hear him and to um, get that, that what God wants to speak to you uh, each day. He is new each morning, including this morning. Um, all right. All right. Andy Rizala, just a health update as far as Andy is concerned. He's taken his chemo and uh, has his good days and his bad days. And that's kind of been the way it's been this week, right? Um, appetite and energy. I think we could all use that. For <laughs> well, he needs it more than we do. All right, any updates with Faith at all? Um, Jeff or, or? She's still at Riley. She's still at Riley? All right, Mom? Thank you all for uh, your prayers. They have sustained us. Really felt like I needed to be here to worship with my family today. God is good. <sighs> Prayers for, um, she has lactic acid in her brain stem, down her spinal cord and in her brain, and that needs to be washed away because that's what's causing the pain. She is, um, heavily sedated, but um, they're trying to keep her comfortable. They've talked about palliative care, and um, that may be the next um, step, but we are believing as a family that we're going to see her smile again. We're going to see her see the joy that she always had on her face. We're going to see that again. But um, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be back with you today. Um, you are my family, and you have sustained us. Thank you. We have been praying. Who's a lady that would like to pray for um, Dave and Alice and Faith, their granddaughter? Does anyone feel led to do that right now? 
Sue, you want to do that? Lord Jesus, we come to you right now, and we lay faith at your feet. We pray the whole and more family at your feet, Lord Jesus. And we know, we know that you are bigger, you are stronger, and you are more powerful than anything that this earth has, Lord Jesus. So we just pray right now, your mighty healing power is just flowing through faith right now. Faith is such a great example of your precious exquisite joy Lord Jesus so we pray against the enemies of darkness who are trying to rob her of that joy that you've placed in her Lord Jesus we pray your peace upon her mother and her father on her grandma and her grandpa on her aunts and her cousins Lord Jesus we just pray right now that your peace that passes understanding will will sustain them till that victory comes Lord Jesus I pray with every passing minute that your precious flood will flow through faith, that it will clear all the toxins, all that lactic acid that's collecting, Lord Jesus. I just pray right now that the thinning will start right now. And as that blood flows through, that you will uh, pass it through her body and will no longer have power in her stem. Lord, I just pray that her muscles will relax. I pray right now that she will feel your power surging through her body, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we stand firmly on your truth and promises, Lord Jesus. We know that no weapon formed against this family and no weapon formed against faith shall prosper. And every accusing voice in Jesus' name will be silenced. I pray for charity in Nick right now. I just pray right now, your power surging through them, your faith that um, moves mountains, Lord Jesus. I just pray that over them right now. I pray that that mountain of lactic acid would just leave faith's body in Jesus name amen and father I just want to lift up uh, Andy Rosales senior as well father just uh, be with him this very morning and Deb um, continue to just heal his body we ask and give uh, that his uh, strength would be there his appetite would be there Lord, we just continue to lift him up before you as well. Father, as the children go now, I pray that you would uh, just be with them and that you would bless their teachers, put your word into their hearts. I pray, amen. Why don't we have the kids line up and go ahead and go. Ushers, why don't you come on up as well and take up the offering. If you have these, um, what are they called, care cards or whatever, um, pass those in the offering plate as well. There we go. Some of you weren't done. While they're doing that, Sandy, why don't you come up? <clears throat> Once in a while, God gives me um, something for someone specific. Um, and um, I just, and it's just a way that I believe God wants to encourage people individually um, and just say that he sees them and he knows what they're going through and, and wants them to um, know individually that he loves them. 
And I, I felt that this morning when I got this verse from Isaiah 40 about waiting on the Lord. And then um, the word that Raj got was along that lines too. And I just feel those two words together are, are for the whole group, but specifically for the two redheads that are sitting in front of each other are behind right, right there. Jess, I know your name. And I, what's your name? I don't, sorry. I, I'm not trying, I don't hope I'm not scaring you with this, but I just feel like God really wants you two to know something. And because you're two redheads sitting in front of you, I just felt like God was like, there they are. So, um, so I, I was hoping, Raj, could you maybe read that word again? Maybe, uh, do you have it written down? Okay. The verse is, those who wait on the Lord, who look for them and hope in him, are going to renew their strength. I feel like God says, I'm going to give you renewed strength for your journey. Um, you are going to be like eagles that rise up and soar above all the issues of life. Um, eagles, they fly above the storm. And that's what I feel like God said, wants to say to both of you, that you're going to fly above the storm. And he's going to give you strength to do that. But I just felt like this word that Raj gave during worship is, is, is for you. So can you come up and read it again, Raj? What? Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, if you just see that, that God just is reinforcing that for you. So. Just let him read one more time. He said, I am your strength and your shield. Every day when, I, when you rise and wake, I am there. Concentrate on me and my spirit will overcome, will overcome you. Look, look to me in the days to come. Every day when you rise... I have your steps planned for you to take. My shield shall, become, shall, shall be upon you, a protection of the Holy Spirit the, and holy armor that cannot be destroyed. For I have dressed you in the spirit of the Lord, and nothing will overcome you. Put your hand in mine and follow me, saith the Lord. What a coincidence. Isn't that something? What a coincidence. You know, I just want to say that um, there are those that say that God doesn't speak outside of, quote, of, the, of the scripture of his word today. And I just want you, to, I want you to know that I'm not one of them that says that. I believe uh, God's word um, his, his rhema word, his active word, his word that he wants to share and he wants to encourage people with and he wants to uh, bolster them with and he wants them to know that he is still walking with them in the midst of things and what he's preparing them for and so on. I think that is so important. And uh, when Sandy said she got that, had a, felt like she had the word and, and she says, do you want to give me give it to, to uh, privately or whatever? And I said, no. I said, this is something that hopefully can raise the faith level of who we are. And I think we need to hear that sometimes. And, and I felt like uh, what Roger shared was, was real important. And so, amen? All right. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate that. Hey, I just want to put a plug in here. Um, you know, Matt said this earlier, but, but the Landmarks books that are back there, I only got 10 of them. Um, they're 20 bucks a piece, but I want to tell you something. They are powerful. Just to read, if you haven't had a chance to read, uh, uh, I mean, if, if you don't understand, if you want a, a, a how should I say, almost uh, theology for dummies, and you know, they got these, these, the work, you know, the, the, the little books, you know, uh, something for dummies. This, I tell you what, this is really a good book. And um, just to give you some of the, um, oh man, I can find the table of contents here. Um, uh, I'm not going to find it. There we go. But uh, it starts off, chapter 1 is the Word. Chapter 2 is the Trinity. 
Salvation, baptism in water, life in the Spirit, the church, healing, faith, prayer, giving, the Lord's Supper, the gospel and the law, worship, and eschatology. Now, I just want you to know that this is the result of when, when I was part of the Foundation Ministries team years ago, and David was part of that team, we had, uh, we had encouraged David to write this book. Uh, and that's why, actually, uh, he says a comprehensive look at the foundations of faith. He actually put foundations in there because it was actually spurred on, and he actually gives our team credit for that as well uh, in, the, in the forward. But this is just good stuff. And it's not, it's not reading that you can't understand. It's very simple, and I, I, that's the way I like it. So, so these are our twenty dollars back. That just goes right back to David, and it's not about trying to sell books. And he, he, in fact, he didn't even bring any with him when he came, uh, simply because that's not what he's all about. But he is about people understanding some of those issues there. Um, also, then he also wrote a book on Revelation. And if you're interested in Revelation and eschatology, I've only got about four of these, but. Uh, this is really good as well, too. It's kind of a commentary on the book of Revelation. And uh, so uh, we have these as well, too. I just wanted to put a plug in there because I think it's important to, uh, uh, to keep, to really to continue to dig in. And for so many that come and sit on a Sunday morning, they're satisfied with just a surface, make me feel good type of thing without really digging into the Word of God. And we are, we are just convinced as leaders, and we are just, um, what's the word, uh, determined, if you will, that we are going to do everything that we can as leaders. Hey, tater. <laughs> That's my tater there, yeah. We're going to do everything that we can as leaders to encourage understanding, reading, and uh, really digging in to God's Word. And so, can I encourage you all to do that? Um, and not just here on a Sunday morning. I, uh, I was, this week, I, was, I ran across an article. Uh, some of you may know, um, there was a, a conference a couple weeks ago called the, um, uh, I think it was called the MLK 50, which is uh, celebrating Martin Luther King and uh, there was a, it, was a, it was a conference uh, with a number of Christian leaders and so on, speaking and so on. And um, one of the things that came up was this, this whole issue of that the, uh, the prosperity gospel is being taught big time in Africa right now. And it talks about one pastor who uh, is really one of the leaders on this prosperity gospel that, uh, as it's said in here, has 20 homes, has 10 Range Rovers, has four SUVs, and two cars. And I say that because the, 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 the word is, and what he is preaching, so to speak, is that we all are supposed to be, uh, we should have the very best, we should have all, anything we want to materially, uh, and so on and so forth. I just want you to know that I do not believe in the prosperity gospel in that respect. And, uh, uh, but this is an interesting thing. Uh, one of the people that, were, that was at this conference was Beth Moore. A number of you know Beth Moore from some or a lot of her teachings and so on. Um, but she says, Beth, Beth Moore argues something similar is happening in America, but in a subtler, subtler shades. This week, as part of a panel discussion on evangelicals and the future of racial unity at the MLK 50 conference, Moore said, while many evangelicals in America are proud to say they don't subscribe to the prosperity gospel, many are guilty of subscribing to the pampered gospel. What I think has happened here is that in our discipleship, we are not teaching what is normative in the believing life. When we carry our cross and we follow Jesus, we are walking into a storm. But what we have subscribed to is a pampered gospel where we are so afraid of suffering and we are so afraid someone is going to criticize us and hurt our feelings, more asserted. This is the gospel work of Jesus Christ, and we are going with him. 
whatever it takes, no matter how unpopular it is. He was hated. We have to have thicker skin than that. I thought, you know, after what we've been talking about the, next, next, the last number of weeks and so on, and, and, and really talking about um, the whole dynamic of Christ and, and, and even, even sin and so on and so forth, and I, 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 I saw this article right away and I thought, yeah, you know what, that prosperity gospel, that's a, that's a, a, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an ungodly thing. I really do. But then it hit me with the second one, the pampered gospel. gospel. And I think so many of us are guilty of following the pampered gospel. So I just wanted to share that just a little bit as just an encouragement to start with today. Um, that's probably, I said it's an encouragement to start with. That's a great encouragement, isn't it? <laughs> but I think you know what I'm saying. And today I, I want to I get, uh, get to something that I felt like God laid on my heart and a passage that... Uh, in this series called One Thing, I can't believe that we haven't really actually touched on this verse yet because it is a powerful verse. And it is in, it is in Colossians. And uh, you don't want to put that first slide up there, Jacoby, uh, and I'll, I'll probably move it from then. We're going to talk today about the preeminence of Christ. And I'll be honest with you, there's probably not a lot of, uh, uh, how, how should I say, um, this is going to be more of a a theological sort of thing where we look on a lot of scriptures and so on. But I think this is so important in when talking about the one thing. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there with me. I'm going to have it up here, but we'll turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. We're going to go back and look a few more uh, verses ahead of that a little later. But I'm going to put it up here as well, too. And... Uh, and this is, the, this is the, the verse we're talking about right here. And it is, um, there we go. And he is before all things, and him, in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. In all things he may have preeminence. Now, the New Living Testament puts it this way. He, Christ, existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. He is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all, who, rise, who rose from the dead, rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. I have to admit, my favorite uh, uh, translation of this is in the children's Bible. And it says it like this. Christ was there before anything, else, anything was made, and all things continue because of him. He is the head of the body. The body is the church. Everything comes from him, and he is the first one who was raised from death. So in all things, Jesus is most important. I like that version, huh? I think that version also, if you get it in actual hardcover, whatever, has a lot of pictures, so in case you would like, I, I like reading books with a lot of pictures. Before we get in deeper into these verses, let, let's, let's, let me just give me a little, let, let me give you a little information on, 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 this, on this passage, this whole book of Colossians. Colossians, uh, Colossians. The book of Colossians was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this to the Colossians because he was concerned with something called Gnosticism. And if you want to look that up someday, it starts with a G, not an N. Okay? There were Gnostics, okay? What, these, what, what was happening in the church of Colossae is that, is that the, 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 these, these, they were trying to reduce, they were trying to reduce the understanding of the supremacy of Christ. They were trying to declare that he was not God. Uh, we have some religions that declare that Jesus was not God. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses declare that Jesus was a prophet or an angel. Uh, the Mormon church has some of that stuff too, that they declare that, that, that Jesus was not God. Now, in thinking about that, uh, Paul directly countered those attacks 
by spending the opening of this letter declaring Christ as the visible image of the invisible God. So basically, Jesus, Paul was saying, when you see Jesus, you see God. You can't see God. Now, we don't see in the Scripture. The only time we see in the Scripture is uh, someone got a glimpse of, of, the, of the back of God, so to speak. But nobody's ever been able to see God. We can't stand to see God because he's too great. He is too awesome. But it says, Paul says here, if you want to know what God is like, if you want to, know, want to know what the characteristics are of God, if you want to know just how he feels, how he thinks, then look at Jesus. Because he's the image of God. Okay? Some would say, some of you here have never, uh, never seen, uh, maybe you've never met Sandy's brother Keith. Josh is in the image of Keith. Would you, fair enough? Fair enough. Okay? So if you want to know what Keith looks like, kind of look at Josh. Okay? He's kind of in the image of, of, of Keith. And see, this is what we're talking about. The only difference is, is that Jesus was God. He was God. But he was in the image. He's in the image of God. So if you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. So Paul was dealing with this whole thing, and he was, and Paul, man, he hammered to the, Colossi, to the church in Colossae, he hammered this thing about the supremacy of Christ. That's why I can't believe that we haven't touched on this verse yet in this, in this series called One Thing, because it truly says Christ is the one thing. He's the supreme. He needs to have preeminence in everything. Now, by the time we get to verse 17 and 18, we see Paul summarizing the supremacy of Jesus in creation. Paul reminds us first that Christ existed before anything else. He was from the beginning. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because of Scripture like Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God is saying, "Let." when he talked about making man, he said, let us make man in our own image, in our image. In other words, it was plural, and there's no, uh, there's no debating that in regards to the, the original language, the original Hebrew. Let's, it, it is, he said, let us make him in our image. There was more than one. And then we start to understand the Trinity. In other words, and we see in the, in the book of John, the, John, John chapter 1, he said, in the beginning was the Word, it was, and the Word was with God, and that was Jesus. Jesus was there from the very beginning. So Paul is establishing, he says, I want you all to know that Jesus was there from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Before this thing, you know, how many of you know that this, this, this wasn't even in existence at one time? It wasn't even in existence. But Jesus was. And then he was part of making this. Not only did Jesus exist, but he's the one that was involved in the creation of the world and now holds it together. I don't know about you, but I cannot, I, it's hard for me sometimes to believe that this world just doesn't explode. It just falls apart. Why doesn't it? Because Jesus is holding it together. It's interesting because uh, hold it, holds it together is the Greek word uh, cohere. C-O-H-E-R-E, -E, which is where we get our word uh, cohesive. So Jesus is the cohesive. He is the glue, if you will, that holds this thing, this thing called our world together. And Paul's saying to Colossians, hey, he's the glue here, Jesus. Not only is he supreme over the natural creation, but he's also supreme over the new creation, the church. And when we talk about the church, we are not talking about a building. We are talking about, the, 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 the word is ecclesia, which is the called out ones. We are talking about those called out. He is the head of us that are called out. He is also the firstborn, meaning the first to rise from the dead. He was the very first one. And now, because he rose, we can rise to new life. We can be a new creation. All these achievements from verse 18, the beginning, the head, the firstborn, makes Christ deserving of preeminence. 
He deserves preeminence in our lives. Here's how the various versions of the Bible describe the word preeminence. Holding first place, standing alone in everything, standing first in all things, inhabiting the most important spot, occupying the chief place, being ordered first. Simply put, he truly is the one thing. He is the one thing. Paul's message to the Colossians was, don't minimize Jesus. Keep him at the most important spot because he deserves and is worthy of that spot. Now, that's pa- that passage highlights our, our whole theme for the year, that the one thing is vital. You see, we, we have to understand we have to understand and we have to know that our, that our understanding and our view of Jesus will impact every area of our life. Now, what do you mean by that, Jay? Well, if we see Jesus as just someone who only showed us another option for living or practical instruction and helps for living, then he really isn't the one thing in our lives. I had an interesting experience. Yesterday I had to go up to, uh, yesterday I had to, go up to uh, uh, Cherville for a meeting on uh, the opioid crisis. And so I didn't know where this place was at, so I put it in. Siri, tell me where. Give me directions to. All right? So it gave me directions. And it told me to go one particular way, and I thought, it told me to get, I, I went to, through Hebron and so on, and it told me to get on I-65. I ain't getting on I-65. No. No. You know what, Siri? You don't know what you're talking about. That's not the best way to go. So I kept on going. And I was going to go all the way over to 41 and go up 41. And I got to Crown Point. There was a festival going on. I couldn't get around the courthouse. So I had to go north only a few blocks farther west than what I would have if I went on 65. And I'm thinking to myself, I guess I should have listened. I guess Siri wasn't preeminent at that point in time. So I, I thought, okay, so I, can't, I was coming home, and, you know, I, I pretty well, I mean, you know, I, I needed to get out of Sherryville and everything like that, you know, and so I, I, I said, home, you know? And, of course, I didn't know where home was, so I had to tell where, tell where home was. So I, I, I'm, I'm driving along, and I get to one of the stoplights on 30, and the guy, for some reason, in front of me slams on his brakes and ends up in the middle of the intersection. That tends to be what happens sometimes when you drive a squad car, that people see you behind them, and they're going to run the light, and they decide, whoa, there's a squad car behind me. I think I'll stop. You know, you're laughing because you've all done it, haven't you? That's what it is. So anyway, he slams on his brakes, ends up in the middle of the intersection. I end up having to slam on my brakes because he slammed on his brakes so hard, and whoop, my phone flies off my lap. So all the rest of the way home, I'm sitting there listening to Siri give me directions where I don't even know where she is at. And I had to think about that. I had to think, you know what? I kept, there was one point in time I, th- I, 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 I said, as if, there, as if she could hear me, I said, just be quiet. <laughs> I know where I'm going. And you know what? I had to think about that. And that kind of parallels probably my life. First of all, I think I know a better way. So I don't follow the instructions that I get. Hey. Quit that now. Quit poking Jim here. I know what you're saying. (laughs) Oh! I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to. If you have any issues with that, you talk to Jim Jim personally afterwards. Oh. Well, yeah. I'm not so sure you dug yourself out of that hole yet, Jim. (laughs) 
Yeah. But anyway, I thought about how that parallels my life. There have been times in my life when I thought, okay, I know how to do this. And I didn't follow directions. I didn't follow his instructions. And I ended up, it kept telling me, when I passed 65, I kept hearing, make a U-turn on such and such a, make a U-turn, make a U-turn. I think, I don't want to make a U-turn. And I'm in the middle of traffic. I can't make a U-turn. But if you know what the word repent means, it means make a U-turn and go the other way. I had to think about that because there have been many times in my life that I've had to make a U-turn and I've had to repent because I didn't follow directions. And I had to think then on the way home, here again, here I was saying, I know how to get home. I know how to get home. And Siri kept talking to me and, turn, good. Oh, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, I wish I could just find that phone so I could shut her off. <laughs> My point being is that parallels with what we do and how we respond in regards to what Christ wants in our lives. And I think we probably all can identify with some of that, if not all of that. It says Christ is to have preeminence. Preeminence. Christ is to have the supreme. It's interesting. I, I read this little, little uh, blurb. It said, uh, Leonardo da Vinci took a friend to criticize his masterpiece of the Last Supper. And the remark of the friend was, the most striking thing in the picture is the cup. The artist took his brush and wiped out the cup, as he said, nothing in my painting shall attract more attention than the face of my master. Interesting quote, isn't it? Because Christ is supreme, nothing else should distract us from him. We must get rid of anything that keeps us from glorifying Christ. And as we've been focusing on this one thing, uh, that we as Christ followers stake our lives on. But, but here's the problem. Most of all, most of us have a lot more than just one thing. A lot more than one, just one thing in our lives. So what does it truly mean to put one thing as the main thing to make him have preeminence? Now the word, let me just share this with you. The word preeminence is the Greek word prechuio. And it means to be first in rank or influence. It comes from the word protos, meaning foremost in time, order, or importance. We see the word, it's, it's the same root word as we get our word prototype. Prototype. The first type or model of something. It is therefore the idea of being first, and in that sense, holding the number one position in the order of things. Holding the number one position in the order of things. If he was there from the beginning and he took our sins upon him, then he has won the right to have first place in that order, to be first. For Christ to be preeminent in our lives, it means we have to learn to order our lives right. Now, I, I just want you to say, I think many of our lives are out of order. I think that's one of our greatest challenges as Christ's followers is that our lives get out of order. That maybe on Sunday, Christ is preeminent. He's number, he's on the top of the list. But as the week goes on, he gets a little farther and farther down. I think we have an order problem. I think things out of order can bring a lot of problems. I think it brings stress. I think it brings a, a, a handful of mixed priorities, not, maybe not even understanding pri our priorities. I think getting things out of order is a challenge for us because there are so many things. I think the blessing of God comes when we have our lives in proper order. And that's the preeminence of Christ, him being at the top. Now, 
Notice these verses here. It's interesting. We talk about order. Notice these verses. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. That's Psalm 37. Now, my version of that verse would read like this. The life of a Christ follower orders his life in God's way, which, mean, which would mean giving Christ supreme place. Or how about this verse? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew chapter 6. To me, that means if Christ is preeminent in our lives, then all the other stuff falls into place. That's the thing. We worry about all the other stuff, and we get concerned about all the other stuff, and we get out of order, and if we'd only get back into order, all those things that we're worried about will take care of themselves. And one more of my favorites. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Proverbs 3, 6. Let's flip that verse around a bit. It appears that if we want God to direct our paths, we've got to acknowledge him in all of our ways, meaning he's got to be preeminent. So it appears there are benefits to having an ordered life. Let me ask you this question. When you look in the mirror, do you see someone that has an order to their lives? Would, would somebody describe you as man, Christ, is supreme in their lives? Christ is number one in their lives. Would that, is that how they, they describe you? Wow, you know what? Christ is really first. I can really see that Christ is first in her life or his life. You know, Jesus may be present in your life, but does he have preeminence? He may be a resident, but not president. He may even be prominent, but not preeminent. He could hold a large place in our life, an important place, and yet not occupy first place. You see, when Jesus occupies first place, Three things are pretty clear. We love him more than any other person or thing. You know, love is probably one of the biggest watered-down words in our vocabulary these days. You know what? I love my recliner at home. I love, I love when my wife makes enchiladas. I love Sunday nights. And I didn't even get into the whole thing of how uh, the, the, the other, other dynamics of our lives and our society about people loving each other. I don't even know if people understand what the word love means anymore. Because it's so used so often, it's so watered down. I love my job. I love my carpet. I love my peanut M&Ms. <laughs> but do you understand how it gives us a kind of a warped understanding of what love is? When we say we love Jesus more than anything. You know, Jesus has this conversation with Peter. And he says, Peter, John chapter 21, he said, Peter, do you love me? He says, do you love me more than these? Now, there's a couple understandings of that passage, but I believe the one that, that he, Jesus was saying, they were just got back in from fishing. And Jesus is talking to Peter, and, and he's frying up fish. And I could see Jesus looking, uh, looking at, the, at the pan or whatever and saying, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Peter, do you love me more than fishing? Peter, do you love me more than all your fishing gear and your boat and everything else? Do you love me more? And he says, yes. And then he says, okay, Peter, then why are you back doing what you used to do and not doing what I told you to do? You ask him three times.
Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I wonder, and I, I, I had the biggest struggle with this uh, the last couple days particularly, and then I was, I was asking myself, do I really love Jesus more than anything? I'm just being honest with you. You know what I mean? Do I even know really what that's supposed to look like? Do I really know what loving Jesus and having him preeminent in my life looks like? He was calling Peter. He says, do you love me? And that brings us to our second dynamic here. He, 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 he said to Peter, he said, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And when, we, when Jesus occupies first place in our lives, there's an unquestioning obedience to what Jesus calls us to do. And so Jesus was calling Peter back, and he says, Peter, what are you doing here? The last time we talked, or, the, what, or when I, not the last time we talked, but the time when I called you, he said, no longer will you fish for fish, but you're going to fish for man. What are you doing fishing for fish? When Christ is preeminent in our lives, there's an unquestioned, there's an unquestioning obedience to what Jesus calls us to. The question I have with that this morning is, have you actually had an unquestioning obedience to what Jesus has called you to? You love him so much that you don't even question what he can do and through you. That means you can't say, well, I'm not equipped for that. Or I haven't got the time or the resources for that. And you start to rationalize. You start to give all the excuses to what Jesus called you to do. If we hold Christ in preeminence, we'll love him. And if we love him, we will obey him. The third thing that is usually clear is there's a complete submission to his will. That means suffering is possible. That goes back to what I read earlier on about uh, Beth Moore's comment. That means suffering is possible. If we're willing, if we, if we are, if there's a complete submission to His will, and He sends us, and He says, "I want you to do this. This is my will for you," and so on and so forth. And and you know what? That in my that's that could involve suffering. That can involve inconvenience. We've talked about that before. But we're so surrendered to Jesus, we'd even die for Him. Remember when I read that article a few weeks back by David uh, on David Platt's book about the people, about the weeping in the Africa around the, around the, around the room and how uh, uh, puddles of, of tears. And about how the, the, the couple that was going away into the mission field and going out into the bush said goodbye to their family because they, they knew they probably wouldn't be back because it was going to be probably their death. That's why I really struggle with this whole, even this whole prosperity gospel that says everything should be good, everything should be, everything should be really, you know, you should be. Oh, come on. Tell that to the underground church in China. Tell that to the underground church, some, some in Africa. Tell that to those people that are being, uh, you know, you, you re, if you get the voice of the martyrs, you read the article from the voice of the martyrs, and you see how many people are losing their lives or getting getting uh, 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 hurt because of the gospel. When Jesus occupies first place in our lives, there's a complete submission to His will. It's surrender. It's a it's a kind of surrender that I don't know if most most of us are are familiar with. When compared with things we feel God has asked us to do that seem too hard, we just need to think about those kinds of stories. For a true Christ follower, God must be first. He can't be second. He can't be just present. He can't be just prominent. He can't just be a resident. He must be preeminent. He must be supreme. He must be the king of your life. 
He has to be the one thing. He has to be the one thing. And when we yield to God, whose authority brings us empowering blessing, we'll understand the blessing of following the one thing and putting Christ preeminent. Amen? Anybody have anything they want to share? I just want to leave you with a challenge this morning. Because I, I think this whole thing of order, I actually, I actually was trying to discern, and I, I shared this with Sandy, um, whether God was going to go down this path of just order, ordering our lives and living a balanced life and so on. But I felt like God said, no, I want you to concentrate on this, about Christ preeminent. Can I encourage you to look at your life and see if Christ is supreme in your life, is preeminent? How is your order? Have you ordered your lives in the right way? Is Christ where you're supposed to be? Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you that you sent to us your image in Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you wanted us to know what you were like. That you wanted us to have a relationship and it was only your son that could make that happen. And it's your son that was there for the very beginning. It's your son that was the first, the firstborn, the first to rise to a new life. It was your son who brought us new life. Lord Jesus, you won preeminence. May we yield to you. May we surrender to you, to you and your will. And may you not just be prominent, but Lord Jesus, may you be preeminent in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to you. Go in peace.